Researchers claim around 50 Chinese men fought in the U.S. Civil War, with soldiers fighting on both sides of the battlefield, and this not including those in the Navy. One of those men was brought to the U.S. by adoption in 1852. His name was Joseph, and his father, Amos Peck, was a ship captain that sailed to Guangzhou. Around this time, Chinese sailors were trading between the Pearl River estuary and Atlantic Ocean. These sailors lived in areas like New York, but Joseph was raised on the Peck farm and decided to take the surname Pierce after President Franklin Pierce. The Peck farm was in Connecticut, uh, so he enlisted at the age of 21 in the Union Army, serving in the 2nd Brigade of the 3rd Division, 2nd Army Corps of the Army of the Potomac. Joseph fought bravely in the campaigns of Antietam and Gettysburg, and although wounded, continued service through the end of the war. Meanwhile, on the West Coast in 1849, a run to California began when James Marshall discovered gold at Sutter's Mill. Word was received in southern China, where advertising proclaimed America a gold mountain, sending exaggerated accounts of prosperity to Chinese whom were otherwise decimated by war. The Chinese had embattled in a 13-year civil war, with one side losing as many as 20 million lives. The first wave of immigration during the gold rush brought around 60,000 people, mostly men, and some like Chum Ming of San Francisco left for the Sierra Nevada and wrote to relatives in China of their good fortunes. Although they mostly missed the first profit, they did well in California with placer mining and within a decade possessed most of the claims in a strike region, turning over small riches their predecessors left behind. The Chinese set up communities called Chinatowns wherever they settled, which included a boarding house lived in by both miners and laborers, Accommodations were rough here, satisfying only a cot and maybe a hook to hang their clothes. And often there was a Chinese restaurant in town as well. Laundry service was an early occupation and merchant stores were one that they could find anything from exotic seafood to general mining supplies. There is a story of a Chinese man who the miners nicknamed John John. This was a, a slang. Uh, he was living in Weaverville, California, and had been washing miners' clothes for months without the cost of his service. The miners laughed at him and teased him, and he finally left camp, and they thought they had uh, got the better of him. Yet the Chinese man was seen later living in Sacramento wearing fine clothes. Turned out the entrepreneurial man had been saving the gold dust from pant cuffs and shirt tails he washed, giving him riches into an early retirement. Chinatown would adopt many ways of the broader community, including brothels and religious centers. The Joss House, or temple, became the center of the community, and some were elaborately decorated, but most adopted the town's resources of wood and brick. Inside, worshippers would burn incense uh, near ivory and jade figures, and pottery was painted, illuminated above paper lanterns that shone off statues of bronze and gold. A brass gong would announce those visitors coming and going, linking them with the traditions of the old world. Chinese music played in loud processions from temples, and Western music may have a bit of influence taken from the tempo and chords. A song like Happy Trails is an example of this. The Chinese women were treated poorly in the mining towns as Chinese overseers or Tong bosses feuded over their dance hall girls and prostitutes. Some women were sold into marriage, and if they did not fall into an abusive relationship, they might settle into some stability. But all worked very hard, especially in laundry and bathhouses or other servitude where repetitive tasks toiled on their bodies. And whatever earnings were made were sent back by courier to the old country to help their families and gain necessary supplies. A uh, Chinese courier took particular actions to survive the lonely trek. He avoided buying things or paying for transport, but instead wore ragged clothes, concealing the money, and taking odd jobs in and around stagecoaches and boats in exchange for food and travel. One can imagine his load was a trunk of items he'd deliver along a route of Chinatowns collecting and exchanging articles and letters from the old country to the communities. Eventually, this led to a full-time business in big cities like San Francisco and Portland. 
By the 1860s, the revolution-torn Kwangtung province brought another wave of immigrants. These men and women worked in servitude also, and one such avenue was in the building of railroads and infrastructure. Central Pacific had a majority of Chinese workers to build the Transcontinental Railroad. The labor was arduous seven days a week, and pay was around 50% less than their white counterparts. Dangers included uh, tunneling, explosives, physical abuse, and exhaustion. An eight-day strike in 1867 demanded a change, but ended when Central Pacific cut off food and essential supplies to the Chinese living in the camps. Although some say that the working conditions did improve. At this time, Chinese made up about 25% of the entire labor force. Dams were dug, they built fences from Canada and Mexico to every western state in between. Farmers and gardeners kept the landscapes flourishing while street sweepers cleaned the town. Chinese restaurants were becoming popular and, and laundry and bathhouses were profiting. Gambling was also an attractive venture and Chinese parlors were established. One might find someone like Lip Shi there. She would go so far as to play the players first, acting drunk and complaining of his bad luck until his last money was pitched in, and with the stakes high, he quickly climbed out, tricking all those involved. He took his winnings and disappeared as soon as he came. She was considered a master of disguise with magician-like prowess and a knack for pickpocketing. Another venture was in that of opium, or ladinum, in liquid form, a drug from the old country used as a painkiller. It was legal until 1906 and thus easily imported. A herbalist named Zan Tin sold his drugs throughout the northern California region, providing a concoction called Heavenly Balm, which was primarily made of ginseng and opium. Women swore by it, but they suffered relapses when it ran out. In other unrelated cases, uh, herbal and holistic treatments did become respectable, including organic purges and acupuncture. However, discrimination brought on by religion labeled many of these as the devil's magic, and healers would have to go into hiding whether they worked or not. In 1882, a culmination of events took place when placer mining that Chinese found success in was overtaken by industrial load operation mining pushing small-time mining out of business. Secondly, the Chinese Exclusion Act was signed by Pres President Chester Arthur on May 6, 1882, prohibiting all immigration of Chinese laborers. It followed the 1875 Page Act that banned Chinese women from immigrating to the U.S. Several other laws restricted their lifeways, and the Chinese were unjustly blamed for depressed wage levels by populist politicians such as Dennis Kearney and California Governor John Bigler. The results suffocated the economy further and led to violent anti-Chinese riots and massacres. At the turn of the century, when mining camps failed, hostility increased and the Chinese left in large numbers for coastal cities, while well, some returned to China. The story of hardship did not end, but finally in 1943, the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed. Chinese Americans became an integral part of the American West, from supply chains to the Transcontinental Railroad to infrastructure and beyond. This is Biographies of the West with your host, Lauren Morgan Richards. Until next time.